In this video, we'll introduce a new type of neural network called a restricted Boltzmann machine, and we'll present its definition. So this is our uh, first example of a neural network for unsupervised learning. So what we've seen before is neural networks that would learn to predict from an input a particular target. So it could learn to predict a class label, or it could learn to predict from an input sequence a sequence of class labels. That's what we've seen before with the uh, feedforward neural network and with the conditional random field. So now we're uh, going to talk about the neural network that performs unsupervised learning. That is, it's going to learn something about the data based on the training set that only contains input vectors. Uh, the use for that uh, was an application of unsupervised learning in uh, an unsupervised learning uh, neural network like a restricted Boltzmann machine is going to be uh, to extract meaningful features uh, about your data that will hopefully uh, make it more explicit uh, what is, for instance, the class to which a particular input belongs to or make it easier to predict other uh, types of uh, um, information about your data that you might be interested in. It's also going to allow us to leverage the availability of unlabeled data. So imagine you actually have a very small label training set, but you have a lot of unlabeled examples. So for instance, you might have a classification of image problem. Uh, perhaps you only have a few labeled images, but you could go on the internet and actually find a lot of unlabeled images that have not been classified into uh, uh, as belonging to the particular labels you're interested in. So that's going to allow us to, to do that. Uh, and that's actually, for those who are, uh, know more about machine learning, that's known as semi-supervised learning, the problem of learning from uh, uh, a data set which contains a little bit of uh, labeled data and a lot of unlabeled data. And uh, we've also discussed that if we perform generative learning as opposed to discriminative learning, uh, then we, in our objective function, we have a term that looks like this, minus the log of the probability of uh, the uh, input. And uh, we've uh, justified using generative learning as uh, performing some sort of regularizer that's data dependent. And uh, so by introducing some unsupervised learning, uh, in certain models we, can, we will be able to think about it as a way of uh, performing this data dependent regularization by doing unsupervised learning. In particular, this term, uh, we can actually compute it for uh, uh, an input vector even if we don't have a label for it. So again, you know, uh, this regularization, we can think of it as helping us uh, perform a particular classification problem if, uh, or any other prediction problem if we have some unlabeled data. So um, in the following videos, we'll see three different neural networks for unsupervised learning. And in the uh, uh, next few videos, we'll concentrate on the restricted Boltzmann machine uh, neural network. So here's an illustration of an RBM. So an RBM is uh, a, a non-directed graphical model that defines a distribution over some input vector x. And uh, it's going to model the distribution of that, uh, those vectors uh, in my training data x uh, using a layer of uh, binary uh, hidden units, uh, which I'm going to call h. So here, h is actually a random variable, much like x in my model is also a random variable. Uh, so I'm going to assume that my visible uh, uh, layer, which uh, corresponds to the random variable x, uh, is going to consist of uh, binary units uh, and we'll talk a bit uh, later about how, whether we can and how we can actually generalize the restricted Boltzmann machine to other types of observations that might be real valued or uh, discrete valued and not just binary valued. So the restricted Boltzmann machine is going to define a distribution over X and that distribution is actually going to involve some uh, latent uh, variables which correspond to my uh, binary hidden units. The way we're going to get that distribution is that we'll first define an energy function uh, which is as follows. It's linear in either h or x. So it's going to be the product of the uh, vector of hidden units times a matrix of connections w times x. Uh, then it's also going to involve, so it's going to be minus a bias vector c times uh, my vector x, and then minus my uh, bias vector b times h. Uh, 
So we can also write it into scalar form where we have explicit sums over the uh, hidden units or the uh, inputs. And, uh, and, and so we see that essentially the energy is going to be the sum of each of these terms here. And to uh, obtain a distribution or probability, to obtain probabilities from this energy function, uh, well, we'll do what's the most uh, sensible thing to do. Uh, much like in a physical system, the probability of observing a particular configuration of our variable of interest uh, is going to be the exponential of minus the energy associated with the value of x and h. And then we're going to divide by a normalization constant or partition function, which unfortunately for a restricted Boltzmann machine is actually intractable. So this z here is the sum of the numerator over all values of x and h. And uh, since x and h are uh, binary, uh, there's an exponential number of values that they can take. And so computing that partition function here in practice is going to be, uh, in the general case, intractable. So we have to, you know, correct for that problem. And we'll see how we do that in the subsequent videos. Now notice that uh, first the bias vector, if a bias CK is negative, uh, then it means that if XK is equal to 1, that's uh, going to uh, uh, decrease this term. So it's because we have a minus here, it's going to increase the energy. And uh, since high energy is associated with low probabilities, then having a bias vector that's negative means that we are going to um, express a preference for XK uh, not being equal to 1. So instead, we'd prefer if it was 0. Uh, and uh, the opposite would also be true. If uh, CK was positive, then we'd uh, this would mean that we'd actually prefer xk being equal to 1 than being equal to 0. Uh, uh, just based on that term, uh, the probability of xk being uh, 1 if ck is positive uh, would actually be uh, greater. We have a similar thing with the uh, biases bj uh, here. If they're positive, then it means we have a preference for hj being equal to 1. If they're negative, it's 0. And then the most important part of the model is really the this connection matrix here. So what each connection is going to model is our preference for both h, j, and x, k being equal to uh, 1. So if it's negative, then it means that uh, if h, j, or h, uh, and h, k is equal to 1, if this is negative, then it means that the probability of observing this under a model is going to be decreased. Whereas if either one was 0, uh, then this would be preferred. This would be because either one, if, it, if either one is 0, then we multiply uh, then this is 0 times whichever value is here, so that's going to be associated with a lower energy. And uh, similarly, if this is positive, that it means that when hj and xk is equal to 1, then the energy is going to be decreased because of the minus here, so the probability is going to be greater. Okay, so this is just an intuitive description of how these different parameters affect the probability of observing a particular configuration for the vector x and the vector h. All right, so that's for the definition of a restricted Boltzmann machine. We have bias vectors. We have a matrix of connections. Uh, the, the part of the model that models the inputs, that involves the variables corresponding to our input vectors, uh, we call it the visible layer. Visible because this is the data we actually see, whereas the hidden layer, uh, which here is a, a random variable, is uh, hidden because we don't actually know for a given input vector x what's the vector of hidden units. This is a latent variable in our model. We can represent that as a Markov network. Um, so what we had before was more a uh, uh, informal representation of what the model is. But if we use the Markov network illustration, and uh, if we assume that now our nodes are going to be the vectors x and h, then we just uh, have a, uh, an edge between x and h because they're sharing a factor. So indeed, p of x h is the exponential of minus the energy. And remember that minus the, en uh, the energy is uh, the negative sum of this term, this term, and this term. So the two minuses cancel out. So we get the exponential of that term plus that term plus that term. And because the sum of uh, the exponential of a sum is the product of exponentials, then we get this factor here times this factor times this factor, okay? 
So the notation based on an energy function is really just an alternative way of representing a product of factors uh, by just taking the exponential minus the energy. Uh, all the sum terms here, they will translate into factors in a more factorial representation of uh, the distribution. A more representative uh, illustration of this would be to use uh, a node for each scalar in our model, so for each scalar value in the vector x and each scalar component in our vector h. And then in this case, we see that uh, we must draw edges between each pair of units in the visible layer with uh, and uh, hidden layer. Uh, and that's because if we write it as a product of factors, we do get this pairwise factor here, which involves both h, j, and x, x, k for all values of j and k. And then the, this factor is parameterized by the entry in the matrix W. And similarly, we have these unary factors here, which express a preference individually for either x or h. And notice that here we don't have any interactions between either the hidden units with each other or the visible units with each other. And that's why we say it's a restricted Boltzmann machine. Uh, we've restricted the connectivity by allowing only connections between the uh, visible and the hidden layers. And finally, if we instead look at the factor graph visualization of the restricted Boltzmann machine, then of course for, uh, we get a factor for each pairwise connection between elements in the uh, visible and hidden units. So each of our uh, pairwise factors are illustrated here, but we also have the unary factors here, which involve just a single uh, scalar uh, variable in uh, our model here. So that's just, you know, what we've gained from the factor graph illustration is that we now explicitly see that we um, actually have, uh, that we have uh, unary factors for both H and X. All right, so that's uh, our definition of the restricted Boltzmann machine. And in the subsequent video, we'll see how to do inference in that model and how to train it on some data.